the difference between exposure-based CBT that we studied as compared to the stress management training is really the element of exposure. This is what we think is the active ingredient to getting patients who have OCD feeling better. And interestingly, we found that in adult and adolescent subgroups, the findings were the same. The same networks were predicting treatment response to CBT and SMT. And therefore, we provide really the first study to suggest a, a conservation of neural predictors to treatment response to psychotherapy. That's Dr. Luke Norman and Dr. Kate Fitzgerald, who will talk about their article on the link between measures of brain activity and how symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder are affected by treatment. Their work appears in the January 2021 issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. I'm Michael Roy, executive editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, and this is AJP Audio. Dr. Luke Norman was recently a neuroscience postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan. He is now affiliated with the National Institutes of Health. His research has looked at treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dr. Kate Fitzgerald is the Phil F. Jenkins Research Professor of Depression and Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. She is the Academic Director for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Co-Director of the Pediatric Anxiety Disorders Clinic. She is also an Adjunct Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology. Her work has examined pediatric anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorders, and currently, she's interested in looking for biomarkers of pediatric anxiety disorders that may represent options for novel targeted treatments. She also has done work focusing on the use of cognitive behavioral therapy in schools. Dr. Norman and Dr. Fitzgerald are co-authors of an article in our January issue entitled, Treatment Specific Associations Between Brain Activation and Symptom Reduction in OCD Following CBT, a Randomized FMRI Trial. Dr. Norman, Dr. Fitzgerald, hello, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for having us. You bet. Now, you both have done work on anxiety disorders with a focus on obsessive compulsive disorder. Before we get into the details of your article in the journal, could you both tell us how you became interested in this area of research? Yeah, so uh, in my case, my interest in OCD really began during my uh, graduate studies. I was fortunate enough to be able to observe each week um, at the National Specialist Clinic for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, which is part of the Maudsley Hospital in London. And one thing that really uh, struck me as interesting about OCD and observing patients at the clinic was how frequently similar themes regarding OCD symptoms would reoccur across different children that had never met each other. And until they had attended the clinic, had always considered their OCD symptoms to perhaps be their own personal quirk that they might have. And the second aspect of OCD that really interested me while I was at the clinic was how patients would often have quite good insight into um, the fact that their compulsive behaviours were not needed to prevent their feared events from happening. But nonetheless, they would continue to carry them out. And both of those aspects of the disorder, to me, hinted at the idea that these OCD symptoms might be mapped onto neural circuits, such as those involved in uh, motivation, behavioral selection and control, and that we might be able to study those neural circuits using functional neuroimaging. So um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in addition to being a, a researcher, I'm also a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I specialize in the evaluation and treatment of pediatric OCD and anxiety disorders. And I think my interest in this, both uh, clinically and research-wise, stems from how common these types of problems are. By the time of adolescence, as many as 33% will um, have met criteria for anxiety and an anxiety disorder. Um, OCD is a, is a little bit less common, but as many as 20% have subclinical OC symptoms. And while we have some fantastic treatments available to sort of stop anxiety and, and OCD early in its tracks, uh, early in the course of life, we also know that many kids and adolescents don't respond. So for example, cognitive behavior therapy is, is really the gold standard uh, treatment for uh, pediatric OCD. And um, about 50% get better and 50% don't. 
So my interest in using neuroimaging was really to understand at the level of the brain, what makes CBT work? Are there ways to use neuroimaging to predict those who will and who will not respond? And by using neuroimaging, would we be able to develop targeted treatments to, to help the kids that unfortunately aren't able to respond to what we currently have available? Well, thank you for sharing that background. Now, your article begins by noting that the symptoms of up to half of patients with OCD do not respond adequately to treatment, and that we don't really have a reliable way to predict treatment response. Could you talk about how prevalent this disorder is among the general population, and then review the conventional treatment approaches? Yeah, so I can uh, start out with that one. So OCD uh, affects anywhere between one to 3% of the population. However, as I, I mentioned just a little bit ago, subclinical obsessive compulsive symptoms actually occur in as many as approximately 20%. With regard to what's the difference between subclinical versus a, a diagnosis of OCD, it's really the degree to which the symptoms are distressing and, and get in the way. So typically we define OCD by the, the symptoms, obsessions, that is kind of intrusive, uh, upsetting thoughts, as well as uh, repetitive compulsive behaviors, which are often directed to neutralize those thoughts. When they, these types of symptoms occur for an hour a day, cause severe distress and or impairment, then you would meet criteria for this diagnosis of OCD. Now, treatments for that, what are currently available treatments. We know that cognitive behavior therapy and a very special type of cognitive behavior therapy involving exposure and response prevention does work for approximately 50% of, of patients. It's unknown at this point, you know, who are those uh, kids or, or even adults for that matter, who are going to respond to this exposure exposure-based CBT, but we do think that there are certain core processes in the brain, such as your ability to um, inhibit responses and or um, experience motivation to do the hard work that's involved in uh, exposure treatment may be related to, to those who do the best with it. The other uh, common treatment for OCD is uh, medication and specifically selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And while some work suggests that cognitive behavior therapy and uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac is a commonly known one or, or fluoxetine is the generic name for that, may be most effective for those with very severe symptoms or for those that don't respond to CBT alone. Generally, it is recommended that CBT is the place to start. So jumping off the, uh, the core processes that you were discussing, Dr. Fitzgerald, your article in the journal examined whether brain activity was connected to how OCD symptoms responded to treatment. And your team compared two different treatments. The first was the, uh, the CBT that you were discussing, the cognitive behavioral therapy that included stimuli designed to expose or provoke symptoms. And the second was a psychotherapy called stress management therapy or SMT, which incorporated stress reduction and problem solving. Could you tell us how these treatments differ and then why you and your team decided to study OCD in this way. So Dr. Norman will likely have um, some comments to contribute to this one as well, but I would just briefly start out by saying that um, the difference between exposure-based CBT that we studied as compared to the stress management training is really the element of exposure. This is what we think is the active ingredient to getting patients who have OCD feeling better. What is exposure? Basically, it's practicing having that feared thought or, or maybe a feared stimulus that relates to the OCD, such as a, a common one is an obsession about uh, contamination. Uh, I might get sick because I touched a germ. And this can lead to repetitive attempts to neutralize that concern, such as hand washing. So an exposure-based treatment will involve purposefully exposing someone to a situation that could involve germs. So could even be touching a toilet seat, could be touching a door handle, could be things like that and then resisting the urge to engage in compulsive, repetitive hand washing. And by doing this, we know clinically that the concern about contamination starts to generally decrease over time. 
This is distinct from the stress management training, which was really intended as a control condition, a control in that it included meeting with a nice therapist on a weekly basis over the course of 12 weeks, which is the same amount of time as what we delivered the exposure-based CBT, but it eliminated or sort of, you almost might think surgically carved out that, that exposure element. So we know from um, clinical work in patients with OCD that simply managing stress, so these could be things like relaxation, deep breathing, kind of problem solving, doesn't really help OCD get better. So our goal was to compare two treatments, the active exposure treatment to this less effective stress management training so that when we scanned patients with an fMRI scan at the beginning before treatment started and at the end, we might be able to isolate predictors of who was gonna to respond to the evidence-based treatment versus maybe there would be somebody who would respond to, to the typically less effective control condition. Yeah, and part of our motivation for including two types of treatment was really that there's been previous uh, work that has looked at predictors of treatment response to CBT, but that work has, hasn't really included a control group, um, which has meant that in previous studies, it wasn't really possible to separate neural predictors of treatment response specifically to CBT versus treatment response to perhaps other disorders or just um, predictors of symptoms getting better over time. Um, um, therefore, by including a control group, we're better able to separate brain networks that might be particularly important for CBT specifically as compared with uh, engaging with treatment more generally. Okay, now continuing to set the stage here, your article points to two neural networks that have been implicated in patients who develop OCD across the lifespan. Could you provide more details about these networks and why they're important? So there are really two sets of brain regions that we think are important in OCD. The first of these involves orbital frontal cortex, striatum, and thalamus. And these regions have been found to be uh, hyperactive at rest in patients with OCD and to increase the activation further when patients with a disorder are exposed to their symptom triggers in the scanner. These brain regions are often thought to play important roles in action selection and motivation. And there's an idea that in patients with OCD, these networks are biased towards OCD behaviors and away from typical goal-directed behaviors. The second set of brain regions that we think is important in the disorder uh, is often referred to as the singular opercular or the salience network. And this uh, incorporates regions of anterior cingulate cortex, anterior insula, and inferior frontal gyrus. And these brain regions are really involved in detecting when you need to engage self-control over your thoughts and behavior. In recent meta-analytic work, we found that patients with OCD had decreased activation during uh, in inhibitory control and interference control tasks, as well as impaired performance in these tasks. Um, and people have suggested that perhaps this links to their impaired ability to control their obsessive thoughts and compulsions. We also thought that these brain regions might be important for CBT. And the reason for that, the reason for that is that CBT uh, is particularly challenging for patients with OCD, requires a lot of motivation. It also requires them to engage self-control over their thoughts and behaviors as they engage with their uh, symptom triggers as part of the exposure, and then control their behaviors as part of the response prevention. So we thought that these brain networks will also be involved in CBT. Now I'd like to turn to some of the methods of your study. What was the makeup of the study participants and how did you go about conducting the study and analyzing the data? I can start that one off. We were especially interested in our study and understanding if adolescents as compared to adults would engage these networks that Dr. Norman mentioned differently. This is because we know that the singular opercular network, that network that's especially involved in self-control, is developing dramatically over the course of childhood and adolescence, which kind of makes sense. You, you develop more self-control as, as you age. And so we were curious whether by studying both groups, adolescents at sort of a more um, plastic period of brain development, as compared to adults who might be more stable, like sort of what you see is what you got with the, the singular 
opercular network and how it's functioning uh, might differ in the way that uh, these th this particular network predicts CBT response. So, so that's kind of what we set out to do. In addition, it was important to us to engage not only that singular opercular network for self-control, but also the reward network that Dr. Norman mentioned that is um, engaged in, um, we think, in motivation for doing the hard work of cognitive behavior therapy and engaging in those exposures that, that OCD patients naturally want to avoid and, and turn away from, but kind of have to do if they're able to participate in this therapy. So in order to examine both of those processes, that kind of self-control process and, and this motivational process, we used a very particular task that I think Dr. Norman might be able to speak to about how it um, taps into these two functions. Yes, so our task was the incentive flanker task, which we used to probe these singular percolate networks and also orbital striatal regions during reward processing. Basically what this task is, it's a cognitive task that requires patients with OCD to inhibit a prepotent response in a cognitive setting. What's important about this though, is the task is purely cognitive. It's really not meant to elicit the OCD symptoms. That is because we're trying to get at this core function of self-control, even outside of OCD symptoms themselves. In addition, when this task requires patients to inhibit a response to some, like a button press essentially um, that they might want to make because they are, are repeating it or it's cued. In addition, we are rewarding patients for giving us the correct response and taking away that reward for giving us an incorrect response. In this way, we're able to study not only this regulatory self-control process that's tapped by just a simple cognitive task, but we're also able to measure how patients during a self-regulatory task are responding to uh, motivational cues, that is rewards. And these were monetary rewards. They would get, as they performed, a little bit of feedback that said you, you won money or you lost it. Uh, that's very interesting. So I think we've done very well setting the table. So we want to kind of get to the results now of your study. And in terms of results, I'd like to talk first about the comparison we mentioned earlier between the group who received cognitive behavioral therapy and the group who received stress management therapy. How did patient symptoms change in each group? So we found that both sets of patients had symptom reduction over the course of treatment. However, in line with previous research, symptom reduction was a lot larger in the CBT group from pre to post treatment. Symptoms decreased by about 50% in the CBT group and about 20, 25% in the SMT group. However, we did have symptom decrease in both groups and this allowed us to look at neuroprotectors of treatment response for both types of treatment. And you also used functional MRI scans before treatment was begun to map the brain regions that are activated during task for cognitive control and reward processing, which you described earlier. So what did this information tell you? We found for patients undergoing CBT that increased activation within singular opercular regions during interference control and in orbital striatal regions during reward processing, assessed at baseline was associated with a greater treatment response. This was in line with our expectations as we anticipated that these types of networks are regularly called upon during the CBT process as patients have to regulate their actions and remain motivated during treatment. We found that this was specific to CBT relative to SMT. Again, isolating brain networks that we think would be important for CBT specifically. An unexpected finding was that for the SMT group, relatively decreased activation in these same brain networks was associated with a better treatment response. We think that perhaps for the SMT group, treatment might be better for patients who need to work on their regulatory capacity um, although these findings were unexpected for S the SMT group, we'll need to work on that in future. That was a fantastic summary, Luke. And um, I think what's really exciting about this work is that it suggests that people with sort of different baseline levels of their ability to engage these networks for self-control and re uh, reward may respond to different types of treatments. 
So those who are better able to engage self-control and reward circuitry may do better with exposure-based CBT as compared to those who are less able to engage these networks may not do as well and surprisingly may even do a little bit better with this, what we thought of as a control condition, the stress management training, which wasn't supposed to have much effect at all. And indeed, it didn't do as well as mentioned um, as compared to CBT. But I think kind of the take home point is sort of different patterns of brain connectivity may predict or identify patients who may respond better to one treatment as compared to another. Now, as you mentioned, you studied one group of adolescents and one group of adults. Did you observe any significant variations with age? Yeah, so previous work had really focused on adults with the disorder. And so a secondary aim of this study was to examine to what extent neural predictors of treatment response are conserved across the age span. We performed a number of analyses to attempt to see if adults and adolescents differed in any way in terms of their neural predictors to treatment response. And interestingly, we found that in adult and adolescent subgroups, the findings were the same. The same networks were predicting treatment response to CBT and SMT. And therefore, we provide really the first study to suggest a, a conservation across at least the age span that we studied of neural predictors to treatment response to psychotherapy. And were there any other notable results that you'd like to mention? I would say that um, one thing that we didn't look at, at in this particular paper is how does the brain change over the course of treatment? Instead, we were really looking at uh, baseline predictors in the brain of who responds to which treatment better. I think this sets us up for future work um, where we can try to understand how does the brain change from um, before to after um, treatment with CBT as compared to a stress management type of approach in patients with OCD and potentially to look at defining groups sort of at the very beginning of, of the analysis looking at, you know, baseline profiles of brain activity. Um, so in other words, there may be different brain changes that relate to different types of treatment, depending on where you start. Now, are there any limitations to your study that may have affected what you and your co-authors found? Yes, yeah, so we had a moderate sample size and definitely before any clinical applications of this work it needs to be replicated in larger samples, different clinics, at slightly different patient populations. We also we excluded subjects with comorbidities, such as autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which are quite common in OCD, and therefore our findings won't be generalizable to patients with these types of comorbid conditions. Finally, although the strength of our study was that we were able to blind our symptom assessors at each symptom assessment time point, a problem in general with uh, clinical trials of psychotherapy is that it's not possible to blind clinicians and uh, patients to what uh, therapy that they were receiving. So now I'd like you to take a step back from your work and kind of help us put your findings in context with the, in, in the literature. So I'm asking you, what would be some of the implications that your work has for our understanding and treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder? Well, I think the work is exciting in that it really brings some older literature that we knew that these um, particular brain circuits that underlie core functions such as self-control and reward processing differ in patients with OCD as compared to patients who do not have OCD, um, brings it into uh, the treatment literature by combining you know, this fMRI study with, with a clinical trial. Why is this important? It suggests to us a way forward potentially to improve treatments that as we mentioned earlier, only work for about 50% of uh, kids, uh, children, adolescents, and adults with OCD. This is really critical because of how disabling OCD can be. And if we're able to harness strategies like functional magnetic resonance imaging to identify not only those who are likely to respond to existing treatments, but to help us target novel interventions that can help those who don't respond to, to what we currently have available, this would really be a major step forward for helping those affected by OCD. Okay, so let's bring it home for everybody. Overall, what are the key points you would say that researchers, clinicians, and other mental health professionals 
should take away from your article and your study? I think it's important to note that um, even though uh, we found this uh, unique predictors of response to exposure-based CBT as compa uh, compared to stress management training, that we also really replicated from a clinical perspective prior work that shows that well, treatments get maybe, or excuse me, symptoms get a tiny bit better with the, the stress management approach. They get a lot better with exposure-based CBT. So taking this forwards, I, I want it to be clear that we're not recommending stress management as compared to um, exposure-based CBT for patients, but rather what we want to highlight is that neural circuits in the brain, underlying self-control and reward processing may help us not only identify individuals, patients who are most likely respond to respond to the best treatment, but also may help us develop alternative treatments for those that are less likely to do so. And finally, you had mentioned earlier that some of your findings had kind of set yourselves up for doing additional work and additional investigation in this area. And so I would ask what recommendations you would have for further research, both for you and for others in this area? So in, in response to that question, I just briefly wanted to say that given that we found these, these different brain networks predicting um, response to CBT, exposure-based CBT versus um, stress management training, and that stress management training we know typically doesn't work as well as exposure-based treatments. Um, this suggests that there may be some benefit to training up the brain. Before somebody even starts a treatment, could you train up more self-regulatory control as indexed by this cingulo opercular network? Could you train up more uh, reward processing reactivity or responsivity in the orbital frontal network and thereby induce a better likelihood of responding to exposure-based CBT? And uh, as Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned earlier on, I think an important thing that we're going to be looking at going forwards is to what extent these abnormalities that have been reported in these brain networks in OCD change over the course of treatment. So our initial study now has been focused on predictors of treatment response. To what extent do these networks improve or change in patients with OCD as they undergo CBT as well as SMT? And I think another potentially interesting avenue of research would be to study to what extent neural predictors of CBT response are conserved across different disorders, such as anxiety disorders, PTSD, where we know that similar exposure and response prevention strategies are used as part of treatment. Dr. Luke Norman and Dr. Kate Fitzgerald, co-authors of an article in our January issue on the relationship between brain network activation and treatment response to CBT compared with a control psychotherapy in patients with OCD. Thank you both for speaking with us. Thanks for having us, Michael. This concludes this episode of AJP Audio. You can rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to it. Please also visit our website, ajp.psychiatryonline.org, to check out trending articles, find CME courses, and watch videos highlighting some of our other articles. APA Publishing has other podcasts you can listen to. Psychiatry Unbound is the book's podcast from APA Publishing. It's hosted by Dr. Laura Roberts, Editor-in-Chief of APA Books. Also check out From Pages to Practice, which reviews the latest research published in the journal Psychiatric Services. It's hosted by Dr. Lisa Dixon, Editor-in-Chief of the journal, along with Dr. Josh Bereson. You can subscribe to these podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, or on any of the popular platforms. Thank you for listening. <laughs>